Dickens was once the jewel of our kingdom, and so it shall be once more! Gondor is one of the great realms of Middle-earth, but they were not always at peace. Yes, there was a civil war that once took place within this great realm, Kinstrife. So let's look at that time when Gondor came to blows with itself today. First things first, do not forget to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel so that you can join the ever-growing Bro Hero. This was a topic that we asked you all about a long, long time ago now, back in the very first uploads on this very channel during our video talking about the history of Umbar, and you'll understand why that is later on. It may not be overly well known, but just like in real life history, there are records of civil war in Middle Earth. And today we look at the one that took place in the realm of Gondor. Gondor's history in Middle-earth was long and storied at the time of the Civil War, which became known ever after as Kinstrife, the killing of one's brothers and sisters. For generations prior to the struggle, Gondor and Arnor had survived as the last refuge of the men of Numenor. And for most of its long history, the people rallied around the king and peace was kept. And yet, like our own history, which is riddled with conflict, the feud which was to break out in 1432 of the Third Age would leave a lasting impact on Gondor and its people. It began with Romendasil II, who sent his son to meet the northerners of Rovanion. Being surprised with what he saw, Valakar, son of Romendasil, took the daughter of the northern king to wife, Vidumavi. The grumblings began in Gondor from here though. Despite a common ancestry, the citizens of Gondor thought that the northern were little better than beasts, and that the son born of Valakar and his northern wife was a break with tradition that would see the largest conflict in the history of Gondor begin at the ascension of Eldakar, half Gondorian, half an acceptable barbarian. The storm clouds gathered in the distance and began to churn, and within five years of his ascent, the pretender army under the usurper Castamir would besiege and raise the city of Osgiliath in such a fashion as to demonstrate what true beastliness was. First, let's do a bit of history to familiarise ourselves with the culture and its people. Gondor was established in Middle-earth by the Faithful. They would establish two realms, Gondor in the south, ruled by the brothers of Anarion and Isildur, and Arnor in the north, ruled by their father Elendil. This does not mean Gondor and Arnor were solely populated by remnants of the Faithful and the communities and exiles they established them. This period is ended by the War of the Last Alliance and since it deserves a video of its own, we will mention it here in passing so we can understand the threats which Gondor faced at the time throughout its history as a people bordering the lands of Mordor. But if you would like that story, then please leave us a comment of The Power of the Ring Could Not Be Undone, and we will happily get working on that for you all. After Sauron was thrown down in this war, Gondor was able to grow in might and prosperity in the years that followed. Although, a watcher ally remained on Mordor ever after, should Sauron attempt to regather his strength. At the time, Gondor would also build and maintain a powerful navy and go on to increase its wealth and power. Gondor's navy would extend the power of Gondor to its greatest heights at this time under the Ship Kings. As they prospered, the dominion of Gondor increased along the coasts of Middle-earth, as they would capture the port city to the south which was important as it had been held by the Black Numenorians, who were rivals to the faithful back on the island and known in that time as the King's Men. It must be remembered that even by the end of the first millennium in the Third Age of the Sun, Gondor was at the noon of its might and power and thought itself untouchable, in control of vast lands and uncontested military and politically by any of the other men in Middle-earth peace and prosperity would, in its due course, lead to a complacency among the rulers of Gondor, and this filtered into the population, leading them to become intoxicated with their own glory and riches. As we see again, when men increase in dominion and in wealth, they become ever more prideful, 
start to lose touch with what had made them worthy of their position. They lose touch with a heritage that was important, one which had been rooted in the goodness of their people, for which they had been awarded the island of Numenor to begin with. In Gondor, it was this continued pursuit of dominion and riches which began their long decline. King Remendesil II fully came to the throne in 1304 after having served as regent since 1240, and he desired to strengthen his position in Middle-earth as it related to a potential revival of Mordor's might. He sought an alliance with his neighbours to the north, and sent his son Valakar to Rovanion as royal ambassador, and there he treated with the petty princes and local lords of the north. Valakar would do more than make a diplomatic alliance, however. He met and later married the Lady Vidumavi, who was born into the most influential family of local princes. They returned to Gondor years later, and the peoples of Gondor were less than impressed at the thought of being lorded over by a barbarian. Valakar and his father were both remembered as good and able leaders, but it was in this time, at the death of Valakar, that the son born of this union between Gondor and the north was to take the throne as Eldakar, and it is this moment where the storm clouds break over Osciliath and royals come out of the woodwork and put forth their own claims, as they were eager to increase their own glory and status, not to protect the values that had been the splendour of Numenor, which, again, lost its way so thoroughly that the survivors were but a small fraction left over in the end. The rain began softly at first, but as fire crawled about the lands and each region was pulled into the wake of this whirlwind, things got more complicated. As a matter of tradition, the kings who came before married distant relations or among the wider nobility to keep the purity of the blood of Numenor, a necessity to preserve the long life that had been descended from Numenor conferred upon them. The marriage accordingly had disastrous consequences for Gondor after several claimants of the House of Anarion began to make their case for the crown. The southern possessions of the kingdom rebelled, and soon thereafter, full-scale civil war would break out in Gondor. The great kings and their ancestors had always benefited greatly from their long cultural exchange with the elves, an exchange which afforded them the wisdom and means to build such impressive structures such as the Argonath and Orthanc. Befriending the elves had allowed them to advance in ways no other tribe of men would ever surpass, and that includes the middlemen who inhabited the lands of Rovanion at the time of the Kinstrife. As the people of Gondor thought of the northerners as little more than beasts, it would be an indignity to be ruled over by such a man, a half-blood. It is an irony Professor Tolkien surely would have intended, the men of Gondor having benefited from their contact with more developed more advanced cultures would not act in kind whenever the occasion to do so presented itself. As they had done at first, they were friendly to their relatives among the other houses of the Adain, but later came to think of them as brutes. They had forgotten the blessings they were given, and have come to hoard and deny those blessings to others out of pure self-interest. The rebel leader was the fourth cousin of Aldakar, and despite his homeland being in the north, Castamir the Usurper would not have the support of those northern provinces such as Kalinardon and Anoria. Each would support Aldakar instead of the pretender Castamir, who would not be long in showing his true cruelty of character. On the usurper Castamir, much that comes to be written portrays him in a negative light from the start, though it must be said that without a broad base of support, he would not have been able to claim the throne in the first place, much less hold it for a decade. Castamir would take the Elendilmir and throne of Gondor in 1437. As a not so distant member of the royal family, he was born to the heir of Kalmakil, 18th king of Gondor, though not directly in line for inheritance. Despite his lack of claim, he was a nobleman and captain of ships in his time. When the heir of Gondor was to be a foreigner, Castamir joined the rebels and put himself at its head, being the closest option people had for a royal and an army. He had great support in the coasts and in the havens of Pelagia and of Umbar. 
when the fires are set to the pillars of Oscilia, and Aldacar was disposed, and so fled with his lady wife to the north, while the city that was made the capital by the brothers Isildur and Anarion burned. The city was not only burned, but was sacked. In this campaign, the great Dome of Stars was destroyed, and the Palantir which had been placed therein was lost in the Anduin. Prior to his usurpation of the throne, Castamir was the Admiral of Gondor's navy. For this and his quick gathering of strength, we must assume him at least to be a bit competent. When Osciliath was sacked and his son put to the sword, Aldacar was able to escape with his skin to the north, and there he took refuge and many counsels, biding his time and attempting to gather all loyal men to his banner. The siege of Osciliath is a turning point in the war, and the cruelty with which Castamir prosecuted the war is here made obvious for the first time, as his actions in this first phase of war would turn the hearts of Gondor away from him, as he committed what we would call war crimes. For one, he put men to the sword after their surrender and the laying down of arms. The siege was long, bitter, and destructive to each party. Aldakar's son and heir, Ornendil, was put to the sword simply to make a point too. This was worse than a crime. It was a blunder, and it would cost him dearly. In due course of a bitter reign spanning ten years, the true character of the usurper would come to be known, and the picture emerges of a petty-minded autocrat who cares little for his people beyond his own caravan of hangers-on and royal suck-ups. He built up the navy and took to developing the southern regions of Gondor, which crucially exposed the north and city centre. Each stood undefended and without guard while Castamir was off on his dalliances. It was when he thought to move the capital and remake it in his image at Pelagia that the people of Gondor finally had had enough, or at least began to admit openly that, well, he just stunk. And all the while, the true king has been looking pretty good in contrast to this usurper, and begins to make inroads towards building up a formidable host to retake his throne and birthright. While Castamir fared poorly as a politician, the rightful heir was able to summon the support of his relatives to the north, and as opinion turned against Castamir in the city, more allies would come to his aid, which began to accumulate numbers as it moved south picking up speed and growing in its turn like a snowball rolling down a hill, turning at last into an avalanche, with rich and powerful provinces pledging their sword to his number, such as those of Kalinardon, Ithilien and Anorian respectively. The march on the usurper's forces culminated in a terrible battle, that of the Battle of the Crossing of Erui where it came to pass that many of the most ancient and noble families of Gondor's history fell in battle. The scions of families who had had their origins on the island, or some grandfather generations removed who crossed over with the ships of Elendil. At the battle's end, the usurper was slain by the heir himself. He repaid the traitor in his own coin, laying siege to Pelagia too. Castamir's sons were able to escape though, as Aldacar had no fleet to blockade the supporters and those who went with them. The sons of Castamir the Usurper fled to Umbar when Aldacar retook the throne. For the rest of this age, the surviving issue of the Turncoat would take power in Umbar, and there put down the foundations for the petty kingdoms in Umbar that followed, each willing to inflict pain on Gondor and aid her enemies, the Haradrim and the Easterling. These enemies of Gondor would in fact not be fully subdued until a certain King Elisar took the throne many years into the future. Gondor had lost many of its people during the Civil War, but thanks to many of the peoples of Rovanion moving further south afterwards, the actual population of Gondor did not fall too far. This Civil War had a great long-term effect on the realm. Those of Gondor became ever more suspicious and cautious of those around them. Many of the pure lines married those from non-Numenorean bloodlines, and those that stayed true would often move to the rebellious realm of Umbar itself. This is really why, when King Aeonur took the challenge from the Witch King in 2050 and disappeared off the face of Middle-earth, no true heir could be found for many, many a year afterwards. 
Gondor could never hit those heights that it truly had once done. But when Aragorn came around, he did his very best to drag them up as high as he could and to really try and make Gondor great again. All of this came from one civil war, one marriage that went against the norm, one kin strife. With that now though, it is time for my question of the day, which is, is Gondor the greatest realm of men? Or do you think somewhere like Rohan is instead? Or maybe even Umbar or Harad are greater in themselves. They're just overlooked for being evil. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section below. And now to shout out our patrons. You guys have been incredible in supporting our short film and we cannot thank you enough. We have the Divine Power tier members of Kevin and Abram, the Fire Demon tier members of Nasheed and Gregory, and the Wizard Staff tier members of John, Andrew, Jennifer, Hunter, and David too. Every single one of you is a true legend of the Brohirim. Finally, if you have managed to reach the end of the video with me today and you are enjoying what you see on the channel, please hit that subscribe button with the bell icon too so that you can be notified of all future uploads. And so, thank you for spending just some of your time with me today and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword.